I am here not to make you feel better about it because it does not get better. Um, yeah, so before I dive into kind of the really interesting stuff and the things that you're actually here to listen to before I get off the stage so that you can actually hear the things you want to hear, uh, my name's Georgia, and basically you've wound up listening to this kind of scrawny little kid talk here today because of a new mantra that I adopted in my life. And that's kind of to just say yes and do something that scares you every single day. So I don't public speak, so this is a bit of a thing. So I got my palm cards and I plugged my USB in, so hopefully that kind of breaks the tension. Yeah. Yeah, it was a... Um, a brave move plugging a USB in at a cybersecurity conference. But um, I've been in cyber for about three years now, um, part full time. I came straight in from a bachelor's in security studies into the cyber realm. So I've, I've always felt a little out of my element. And I thought, you know, what's a better way than to fix that than get in front of a big group of people who seem to be speaking every single day, um, who are also in the industry, and then give a public speech about something in the industry. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I decided to do, and that's why you guys are sitting here listening to me talk. I became interested in intelligence consumption and social media manipulation during my studies, and it's an area of keen interest that led me into kind of what I'm here to talk about today, which is cognitive hacking. So the, the problem, like let's break it down. We've got the problem. And I mean, 2020 was a problem in itself. It was a hell of a year. And I'm not just referring to the pandemic, the US election, the wildfires, or even the murder hornets in the US, but I'm also talking about the rapid growth of social media platforms like TikTok, the rise of Zoom, or if you're on the other party, the dreaded Teams. Um, and their role and the role that they played in facilitating our everyday interactions in our workforces. And they would just, the unprecedented number of years of digital transformation that we went through in just a few months. What last year also brought home to me, at least, was the strength, reach and influence that a lot of these mediums have in the way that we think, feel and behave. I mean, how many people now are dancing on the side of the street with a camera? Um, but the manipulation of social media has now become common practice, and it's given rise to the dangerous normalization of cognitive hacking. Cognitive hacking, in short, is the manipulation of information media in order to subconsciously influence a demographic, which means to influence others to think or act in a certain way to achieve an end goal. This vulnerability is being increasingly exploited by nation states, but not just in nation states, it's also being increasingly exploited by opportunistic individuals alike. The rise of social media, cyber innovation and communications technology has given nefarious actors unprecedented access and ability to cause fundamental shifts in the way that targeted demographics think and behave. Often, these ways are actually quite subtle and imperceivable. What we've found is that perpetrators are able to manipulate information to the point where it's become weaponized, and it's now a tool by which subtle warfare is able to be waged. Recently, the cadence of concerted disinformation campaigns has proliferated immensely, with inflammatory, false or extremist narratives being used to conduct war, destabilize populations, and even cause reputational damage. But to say that cognitive hacking is new would be a lie. In fact, it's far older than the internet yourself or even your Sony Walkman. It's, a, it's an outdated joke for a millennial, but we'll go with it. <laughs> The, um, the use of information and in the media to wage war is far removed from the traditional concepts that we know of warfare. Um, but it's surged in popularity amongst actors today. And that's because it's cheap, it's largely risk-free, it's readily accessible, and arguably it's easy to do. Arguably, I'm in GRC. Effective cognitive hacking 
affords those who wage it the same parity of power as though they were fighting a knife fight with an assault rifle. And the consequences of targeted attacks include not just massive long-term economic and reputational harm, but it can actually bring about widespread damage, civil unrest, and the loss of human lives. So the cost of cognitive hacking is just a mere pittance in comparison to buying a single conventional weapon. Forgive me for this being in the US dollars, but you get the same idea. Reports from Trend Micro found that it costs just $2,600 to buy a social media account that had 300,000 plus followers. It also would cost 55,000 US dollars to successfully fund a discrediting Twitter attack on someone. And it costs only $400,000 to influence policy trade agreements, impact elections, or even change the course of a referendum. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but the prospect of spending just $400,000 and to influence, say, an election outcome, whilst maintaining a degree of plausible deniability, instead of spending what Forbes estimated was approximately $178 billion by the Pentagon in one financial year alone for military technology, that's not only attributable, but then it also requires additional maintenance, training, and operational costs. Well, well the difference between that just sells itself. So I'll admit, whilst the $178 billion wouldn't be spent on every single operation, and it would be part of a weapons development and acquisitions program, the sheer difference in cost, but also the opportunity to leave subtle impacts in groupthink and in other direct consequences at such scale, proves that spending on cognitive hacking campaigns is far more beneficial than conventional military spending. And what is becoming increasingly common is that it's notoriously difficult to pinpoint where these campaigns originate and whether they're state-sponsored or rogue individuals. In fact, in many cases, it's likely that even the actors carrying out the profiles and activities themselves don't exactly know by who or to what ends their actions are directed. So then we go into the evidence and the details. Efforts of cognitive hacking, like I mentioned before, are by no means new. So there have been examples of concerted efforts to create tools that could influence the population behaviour, extending all the way back to the 1960s. And it seems that in the US, Democrats have had their fingers on the trigger long before concerted campaigns like you and I would know have been waged in US politics recently. The Simulmatix Corporation, uh, the name being a combination of simulation and automatic, well, they opened for business in 1959. Simulmatix have actually been credited with pioneering data manipulation and using data and technology to develop a tool that was able to predict and influence people to change their mind and think a certain way, especially on topics as broad as purchasing preferences to their voting behavior. So they did this through the use of a program known as the People Machine, which was in part attributed to the election of JFK as president in 1960. The people machine used data mining techniques like you and I would know today to create a model of the voting population that would then tell you how voters would respond to certain messages. It was these responses that then influenced the methods of how, in this case, the JFK campaign would then mobilize and speak to the populace Now, if that isn't enough to elicit at least some concern for you, then here's some more recent and salient examples, such as the sheer power of cognitive hacking can be seen in Cambridge Analytica. Now, the Cambridge Analytica go Brexit, that's kind of been done to death. But Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm in the US, 
did influence arguably one of the biggest events seen in the last five years. And that wasn't the 2021 election, but the US 2016 election. In 2016, Donald Trump's campaign team bought the data harvested by Cambridge Analytica. And this was data regarding the personalities of US citizens, and they used this to target voters on social media. So where you had a swing voter, that person would be inundated with advertisements that highlighted negative images and ideas of Hillary Clinton. Uh, while those who displayed pro-Trump qualities would be shown victorious images of Trump, probably holding one of the amendments upside down in his hand, um, and information on where they'd be able to go and vote for him. So while the use of these ads can't, we, we can't claim them to be the sole reason that he won, uh, advertising does have impact value. And the inundation of promotional material that played on individuals' innermost fears undoubtedly played a role in the mobilization of that vote. Another prime example that I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of is a group that's been conducting and waging conservative cognitive hacking is the Internet Research Agency. So the Internet Research Agency are a Kremlin-led troll factory, and they're thought to have been the instigator of discord and disunity in the United States a number of times in recent years. They do this by stoking both sides of emotional and political and ideological debates. An influence operation, also known as Project Lakta, actually generated divisive social media posts for both sides of one argument. Significant social causes they targeted, like LGBT rights and gun control. With an operational budget of 10 million US dollars for only the first half of 2018, the group were able to use things like sock puppet accounts to promote and inflame viewpoints and then encourage a real world protest, and then in response to that, a counter protest, which would actually elicit violence in some cases. Similar to the Internet Research Agency, the Chinese government has also been embroiled in manipulating social media to influence opinion and create, in some cases, overwhelming amount of popular pro-regime messages supporting Xi Jinping's Communist Party. According to a study conducted by Harvard University, a group also known as the 50 Cent Party, aptly named for the amount of money they receive for each post they create, was hired by the Chinese government to create content that framed the political party in power in a positive light. And they used this particularly in times of political instability. Political instability, for example, in the wake and outbreak of deadly 2013 ethnic riots in the Xinjiang province. During this time, there were hundreds of pro-Beijing messages posted online to counter uh, a lot of negative news that was coming out. But not only that, it's thought that around 240 million of 488 total million propaganda messages were actually posted on a slew of social media networks during that time by this group. Interestingly enough, though, the aims and objectives of this group wasn't to spread disinformation in this example, but it was actually to pay staff to manipulate social media in an effort to provide a counter-narrative to the negative news and opposing messages but instead with the intention of distracting the population from the criticism. So a lot of the examples that I've spoken about today have been relation to political ends that cognitive hacking might take place. But cognitive hacking is also used to bring about financial gain and could also be directed towards creating financial windfall. For example, I'm not sure how many of you remember this, I was too busy tweeting Justin Bieber at this time. But in 2014, during a time of heightened sensitivity around terrorism, this was coming at a time just after the Boston Marathon bombing, actors actually compromised the Associated Press Twitter page and they tweeted out that there had been two explosions in the White House and at the time President Obama had been injured. 
As a result of this tweet, uh, the Dow Jones plunged over 140 points. Uh, the dollar and the yen also temporarily plunged. Reuters estimated that the event resulted in a temporary loss of market capitalization in the S&P 500 alone to be about $136.5 billion. I don't really understand the financial stuff. I'm still young. <laughs> Straight over. Uh, whether this financial consequence was an intended objective, it does highlight the potential financial consequences in this case that preying on current socio-political fears, cognitive hacking can actually bring about. So the use of cognitive hacking, information manipulation and influence operations as a mode of warfare well, in modern conflict, that's expanded the scope of the battlefield and that's expanded the ability for us to conduct war out of the purview of the state and state actors and into the hands of the girl next door. And that's, uh, that's me at Christmas, so I go hard at Christmas. <laughs> Cognitive hacking has been used by nation state actors uh, to conduct war. And as a result, this has contributed to the blurring of previously well-defined battlefield borders. This is because state actors have moved to sponsor or outsource the conduct of battle to actors in the cyber landscape. And we notice this by the cyber threat landscape always increasing. For example, while Russia hasn't necessarily sent their military in, guns blazing, to pillage the land of their opposition, um, they do and have supported the efforts of hacking groups such as APT29, uh, more commonly referred to as Cozy Bear, and they've done that for the same effect. Cozy Bear are employed, we'll say sponsored by uh, the Russian government and the Kremlin uh, to conduct sophisticated campaigns and these campaigns are aimed at covertly subverting, interfering and destabilizing their opponents to the same extent, if not more so, than what would be caused by conventional warfare itself. While we can't attribute the attacks with 100% certainty to them, it's, it's never a, a certain thing, uh, many security practitioners have attributed a lot of events to these groups, or this group in particular. Cozy Bear are just one tool in uh, the Kremlin's arsenal via which they can wage war. However, because this group is supported by the Kremlin, we'll say they say supported, uh, by the Kremlin and Russian intelligence and not actually waged by them because it's outsourced. Uh, the Russian government is afforded a degree of separation and plausible deniability that they wouldn't otherwise have had were they to engage in a conventional battle. So another key tool that's taking uh, the art of information manipulation to dizzying heights is this, the deep fake. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. All right, so this is a deep fake video. And as a cybersecurity practitioner, I can tell you now that we're seeing this develop as an emerging threat. A deepfake video, for those of you that might not know, is a video of a person in which their face or their body has been digitally altered so that they appear to be either someone else, and this is typically used maliciously or to spread false misinformation. Terrifyingly, just by doing a simple Google search, uh, you're able to find free online deepfake generators that offer services and software that allow you to create your own legitimate deepfake video. 
So these pose a particular challenge, not just because they play homage to the seeing as believing, but because for those that are well designed, they can actually be extremely difficult to detect and they require significant and time consuming uh, video analysis to break down. What we're also seeing is the use of deep fakes by opposing political parties to discredit the uh, other side. And Donald Trump was a prime example of this uh, last year when he tweeted a manipulated video of Nancy Pelosi. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. We want to give this president the opportunity to do something historic for our country. What you can see in this video is that it's actually been slowed down and Nancy Pelosi, so this was um, caught out by a group called Politics Watchdog and in this, um, in this video Nancy Pelosi has actually been slowed down and her voice slurred a little bit so that she appears quite inebriated and incoherent. And for poor Nancy, this is just one video, but it's happened about two or three times now. Um, so what's been done to actually solve this problem? Or more importantly, what can we do? Well, this isn't gonna make 2021 any better. As I mentioned before, and what's quite troubling for me, is that as a cybersecurity practitioner, I actually don't think there's a, at least any one solution to this problem. Um, in 2009, so troubled by the development and the use of cyber operations and cyber warfare, a group of international legal and uh, scholars and practitioners convened and drafted what became known as the Talon Manual, and then later on in 2017, the Talon Manual 2.0. So originally, this actually focused on cyber operations such as cognitive hacking. This was focused by and large on the most disruptive and destructive, destructive cyber operations. And these were those that took place between states and those that might actually elicit a kinetic response between states. Although in 2.0, the scope expanded, it's, conflict, it's focused on conflict between nation states. And the reality of cognitive hacking, if I haven't introduced that by my Christmas videos, is that information warfare is irregular and asymmetric in nature, and it's gonna be waged by state and non-state actors together. Other efforts at combating the problem of cognitive hacking have actually been seen in China. Um, but China moved to more isolationist protective measures to prevent the impact of this threat on their population. And they did this by regulating their own internet through the Great Firewall of China. This Great Firewall was proposed as a method of preventing foreign interference by other countries in the internal affairs of China. Uh, it's made up of active filtering to prevent content from being accessed internally. It's made up of probing, which probes networks, um, services such as VPN or Tor that could potentially circumvent the firewall. And it's also made up of proxy distribution technologies. One problem that I see with this is that the Communist Party and similarly any other government who imposes these means still has the ability to influence the messages that do reach the population. And by doing this, they're actually able to significantly censor the population, and if they want to, punish those who disagree with certain ideologies. Not only that, but things like the Great Internet Firewall of China, a lot of those measures are quite incongruous, incongruous with a lot of our democratic social norms. Another potential, but also high-risk and controversial solution would be to block certain communications to a population or group of people. While, however, this might limit the exposure of influential content and some cognitive hacking campaigns reaching a demographic, the blocking of a lot of communication and information might be perceived as threatening to human rights uh, and might be used to cover up other abuses of power and cover up other content from other countries. Another 
possibility would be to continue pressing on educating people regarding awareness and cyber hygiene. But as a security consultant who spends a lot of time and effort pursuing these ends, I must confess that I really do have serious doubts about the efficacy of these endeavours. Then you have the other regularly commonly suggested silver bullet, which is to simply regulate big social media companies. But I think that we can all agree that in actuality, the viability of this in such a complex and dynamic landscape is really moot. I mean, a prime example of this would be a recent attempt by the Digital Industry Group, or Digi, uh, who released a code of practice for social media platforms that had seven objectives. And one of these objectives was the goal of tackling disinformation in advertisements, prioritising news content that had been fact-checked. We all know how that went for Australia. Uh, and improving political advertising that takes place. However, this is all very nice in theory, but while big names like TikTok, Facebook and Google have signed up to this code, bringing it back to what I previously said, the viability of this is moot and attempts are really half-hearted at best. This code is actually completely voluntary to ratify and for signatories that do sign up to it, they're able to pick and choose the parts of it that they want to codify and those that they don't. So where, for example, Facebook's bottom line is going to be negatively impacted through advertising revenue, I don't think that you would sign up to that. I might be a bit pessimistic, but that's, that's just me. To further this, uh, any attempts by states and international institutions to codify the laws of war for the cyber and ICT realm, they're going to be fraught with the same difficulties of conventional protocols and doctrines. And that's that states can choose to abide and ratify them at their discretion. So I was recently asked to speak at a UN working group about the issue of cognitive hacking. It was all on Zoom though, this is my first IRL. Uh, and you know, how cognitive hacking was a major threat to international peace and security, and then how can we help combat this issue? But I found myself with the same problem. And this was an audience and people that have significant influence and significant tools at their disposal, and you know, they could get whatever they wanted at their beck and call, but I still had that same problem. So, to be honest, I'm still of the opinion that there's going to be very little that can be done. So what does that really mean for us? Well, sorry, I told you it wasn't going to be a great, hopeful, inspiring, we can, we can solve this, but it's not. Um, I think that we've got a fair trot to go and we've got a fair bit of work in front of us and that might actually be good news to a lot of us. Um, it is possible that by increasing, the increasing use of cognitive hacking by countries is going to become a new normal. Similar to how there was an erosion of privacy with um, the advent of the digital age, as we continue to become more connected to global communications and social media, the landscape that cognitive hacking can, but the landscape that it will take place is only going to grow. And I believe it's going to be something that we need to embrace. If not embrace, then accept. Understanding and embracing the fact that these campaigns are going to continue to exist and take place is going to allow us to focus our attention on being able to combat them by raising awareness, but also by raising our capabilities to critically analyse the information that we receive every day on these platforms. Personally, though, back to my pessimistic attitude, I've kind of ceded acceptance to the fact that cognitive hacking is taking place and that it's going to continue to be conducted at great lengths in the future. I believe that this will influence the work we do as cybersecurity practitioners and that a large part of our future is actually going to be spent re-establishing the erosion of trust that efforts of cognitive hacking spend mere minutes destroying. When it comes to my own approach to information media, 
Uh, I take each article, each advertisement, and each message with a grain of salt. Um, I think about why I might be on the receiving end of it and how it actually makes me feel. I feel that displaying this type of critical analysis when you get these messages and these feelings or these influences are being exerted is probably going to be a, a way of the future and I encourage you guys all to do the same. And uh, that's my first IRL talk. Round of applause. I'm just watching V's going to run back in. Uh, has anyone got a question? Stick your hand up and I will bring the mic out to you. Someone's got to feel as depressed as I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 11.30 a.m., it's time to drink somewhere. My, my kids are still little, so I'm just hoping by the time they're old enough to, to use social media, we will have realised it was a mistake and, and maybe have started again. But I think there is very little chance of that happening, so... Oh, yeah. Hello? <clears throat> uh, yeah, hey, Jidra. Um Really enjoyed the, the talk. Well done. Um, just wondering, at least the cognitive hacking that is done by nation-state actors, is it related to or even synonymous with um, psychological operations? Oh, yeah, exactly. That's so, uh, like, a lot of it is psychological operations to actually get someone to behave in a way that they want. Um, a lot of the time... Even with uh, nation states, it could just be to let other nation states know that you're there. And then there's that fear in the back of your mind that you know, someone's actually out there and someone has the same capabilities as me. So even if it isn't always to be done uh, directly on an individual or play on an individual fear, a lot of nation states will actually engage in psychological warfare through cognitive hacking, just to let other nation states know they're there. Okay, that's disturbing. <laughs> yeah, it is disturbing, isn't it? There was one down the back there somewhere. Just looking towards the future, do you think people are going to start developing the same cynicism we have to advertising for cognitive hacking? I think that will come with each individual. Um, and I think it's probably a bit of an awareness thing as well. I don't think if you're not aware of the threat, you're not really likely to display those critically, or that critical analysis that maybe myself or you would actually display. But I think it would be a good idea for it to be displayed more in the future. Um, because like, I can't really log on to Nine now and think that you know, The Bachelor is is all that. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I think it's critical analysis is, is going to be the way of the future. Marco up the back and then there was one on this side. Um, thank you for your talk. It's really good. Right. I know this is a bit of a leap, but in a, when you're running an application, if you're trying to run it in a trusted environment, you're supposed to follow a trust chain from the very beginning, so that at least when the application runs, you can verify if it's definitely the application you're expecting and where it came from. When um, at least entities like governments or those who have an enormous amount of influence and power, would it be possible to consider that they themselves need to follow a trust chain before they actually publicly announce things that have a huge impact on a large number of people and then eventually it'd be great if that actually went into the mainstream media as well so they actually are held accountable for what they actually say and that they have to prove that what they've said is real would some form of trust chain at least not for the majority of communications but for the absolute core ones start setting um, a path of objectiveness about a claim yeah but do you really trust your government no but that so take for example the rule of law right if there's actual if there's an actual um penalty a, a, a literal legal penalty for being in breach of that trust chain you know generally human behavior is affected by carrot and stick right but if a government comes out and makes a statement any government mm. if you have that trust chain that's required of them that sort of starts limiting the amount of willy-nilly nonsense that they can get up to, right? And then that starts setting the tone for everyone else. I see where you're coming from. Um, 
but just like things like the international, like for example, you know, a lot of states take each other to court and they do this through the international criminal court. Um, but they don't have to turn up to the hearings if they don't want to go. Uh, and I think this, it's the same thing. Like you can, you can say someone's done something or you can say that you have done something, um, but you know, it comes down to how much you really trust the word of mouth, really. I, I don't know that you could actually do a, an application trust chain for governments and then uh, I don't actually know how you would keep it accountable. Um, with the proliferation of um, these sorts of techniques, do you think that they offer opportunities for um, the reduction of physical violence in terms of... Um, or th these sorts of techniques, they sort of offend our sense of democratic norms and sort of our sense of ethics. But do you think that with the increasing efficacy and how widely these are being used, that they maybe offer opportunities for states which do seek to exert a high degree of control either on their populations or on others to reduce the amount of physical violence that they need to use? Do you think that, that there are any positives in that sense? Um, I, I mean, one example that springs to mind would be uh, China, and they've actually set up like a, a biometric you know, reward system um, to influence the way that their population behaves. You know, you get good points, you get bad points, and then you get told if you're on the phone with a good person or a bad person. Um, and that's actually shaped a lot of people to conform to the Communist Party's uh, ways. But I, I personally don't see that as um, being positive because it's, it's kind of stifling, uh, you know, individual... Uh, it's stifling a bit of an approach, but I, I'm sure that with proliferation you can see positive effects in people um, and real world actions, but like I mentioned before as well, you see a lot of it being used to create one protest and then a lot of it to create a counter protest at the same time so that the two people actually and the two groups actually erupt into civil unrest. I hope that answered the question. Oh, hi. Um, loved your Christmas outfit. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> My dog was dressed up the same. It was you great. You definitely go hard on Christmas. Oh, Halloween. Um, you know what? Valid, critically validating information is exhausting. Oh, I it think, is. Um, I think you know, at some point you end up falling prey of you know, the um, uh, media fakes or... Uh, etc. Cognitive hacking, because there is a limit to what you can, you know, critically uh, embrace and understand and process and churn, etc. Right? Yeah. Uh, but that was not my question. So my question is. Oh, damn it! Because that was <laughs> going to be an easy one. <laughs> now, um, do you reckon? Because yeah, there. I I agree with you in the depressing, um, you know, uh, forecast that there's not going to be a lot that we can do so far, maybe when quantum uh, you know, computing becomes, I don't know, some uh, mega AI algorithm that's going to start whatever. So anyways, would it be possible, or do you, do you reckon it is, we should start thinking like companies, private companies, and you know, well, nation states already do it, but in terms of warfare, um, and stand up some so like taking seriously taking social social media seriously in a way that you can counteract um, fake news. For example, some companies don't believe that having a social profile it's that relevant. Maybe they do it just because everybody else does it, uh, but they don't really uh, understand the impact that they can have. If you have a proper, if you actually invest in that, like your marketing department is your war department, right? Uh, your social media communications department is like you're waging war out there. If there is fake news uh, from a very you know, high profile tweeter saying, you know, your company did this and it's terrible and blah, blah, blah. And you also have to counteract that, you have a high social media profile that you can say that is fake news. Mm. Um, do you reckon companies should start to think in those terms to get ready 
you know, to create higher social media profiles that they can unleash out there to counteract potential fake news. So I think if I got that right, is it... I was um, going to say, based on that question, you should submit a talk next year, just the length of yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a huge question, though, like, whatever, you know, um, you can... I don't think it would be... I, I think, you know, you can... A lot of companies can actually piggyback off social media platforms to... Uh, and bigger companies if they're being victimised. Um, a lot of the time, you know, it'll still be a bot, so you'll kind of be able to notice it. Um, but, I mean, it's a good point. It, it's a good point. Uh, I, I, I would worry about getting caught in a creating followers and maybe even buying, like the company might even start buying followers just for the sake of arming up an arsenal in case it does happen. Uh, because it's basically one piece of news media versus another piece of news media then. And then it's just a, a war of words and people can believe who they want. Um, so I, I'm not sure how useful it would be for a company to invest in that. Um, but I'd be interested to listen to your talk on it. Another round of applause for Georgia. Yeah.